Start. Welcome everyone to uh, the workshop on multi-arch. Multi-arch is a new and tricky subject and we have Steve Langasek doing a nice workshop for us, so here you go. Well, it's not really all that tricky. It just completely flies in the face of everything we thought we knew about how we put packages together. It's not all that complicated, really, when you get right down to it. Um, so I was talking with Wookie beforehand. He, he uh, uh, tricked me into doing this workshop, and so I was asking him what he, he was looking to get out of it, and, um, and basically kind of the conclusion we came to is uh, we have this wiki page on the, on the Debian.org wiki, um, which I'm more or less just going to be reading through and walking people through, um, after which uh, we'll take some questions and I'll show a few examples and whatnot. But, um, right, so starting with the basics, and actually I should find somewhere else that actually mentions this, which I don't think is in here. Um, the, the first thing to, to talk about um, is, is what is multi-arch and what does it mean to, to convert a package for multi-arch. Um, Increase the font, um, in theory. Where does that setting live? Better? Good enough? All right. More? Okay. Um, right. So the... Um, what does it mean to convert a package for multi-arch? So, so the basic idea of multi-arch, which if you were around for uh, the last couple of hours when we were talking about how we're using it in cross-building, um, you already know all this. Or, um, uh, but in any case, uh, multi-arch is the idea of installing packages for more than one architecture on a single system um, and structuring those packages so that they can sanely coexist together uh, on the file system where it, everything that needs those files agrees on where they should live and is not confused by things subtly moving them about underneath you uh, to, to try to shoehorn things onto the file system. And so instead we say, no, each architecture has its own directory. That's always where its libraries should live and everything should look for them there. And, and as long as the entire system agrees, it, it works great. Um, and it, it allows you to mix and match um, libraries and, and packages of any set of architectures. So this is not simply about x86-64 plus uh, i386 or anything like that. It's, it's much broader than that. People are using it for cross-compilation environments. They're using it for emulation environments where any binary you might want to run on any system, it should be possible to at least satisfy the library dependencies and install it on your system such that provided you have some way to execute it, that the packaging system doesn't get in your way. That's effectively what multi-arch is about. Um, so you get to reuse the existing packages um, from the archive of any architecture, and you can install them with, with the, the support and integration of the package manager. And now, as far as what it means to, to convert your package to multi-arch, um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a little bit reaching here. I'm going to drill down a little bit here because I want to get a, a reference up on the page, and I'm sorry, I haven't actually prepared any slides at all for this. Um, one sec. Right, so here's the key bit from the actual multi-arch package management specification, um, which is what does the multi-arch field mean? Um, and this seems to be a tricky bit for a lot of people um, because we didn't user test our, our naming scheme before we deployed it. And uh, focus yeah, we, we should have had, had some focus groups involved in, in figuring out what the right names were. So um, to try to clarify this in everybody's mind because it has been an, uh, a big issue uh, for understanding um, what exactly it means. So multi-arch colon same means the package that's tagged multi-arch same is a multi-arch package, it's aware of this multi-arch system, and it satisfies the dependencies of a package of the same architecture. Multi-arch colon foreign means it's a multi-arch aware package that satisfies the dependencies of packages of foreign architectures as well as those of its own architecture. 
um, which is kind of the reverse of how a lot of people try to think about this. So if there's one thing you take away from here, that, that's, that's kind of the big the bug number one in, in terms of how this has been doing. Okay. Uh, I was asked to give an example, um, and I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so your typical library package, um, um, let's say libpng, um, so you create uh, a package that's multi-arch for libpng, and it has as its contents, You've got your doc directory, and then you've got files that have that are in lib triplet libpng.so.such and such. Um, so it's a library package. It's it's clearly been configured to do the multi-arch thing in that its files live somewhere that you can have a separate set of them for each architecture. Um, now the question is, now you've got this package. What what how, what kind of dependencies? What kinds of things depend on this? Well, the answer is things that are AMD64 binaries that will link against this library or will DL open this binary, or the DL open this library. So anything that depends on libping has to get the version of libping for the same architecture. So that's what multi-arch colon same means. Um, the converse would be something like, Larger? Is that good? Sorry? Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Anyway, so looking at things that are available on, on the system here that um, are marked multi-arch four, and let me find a good example that we can look at. Um, R-Sync, was that on the list? Okay. So, R-Sync, it, um, yeah, it's been marked multi-arch foreign, and why would that be? So let's look at what the R-Sync package contains. Um, you've got user share doc, um, some files and et cetera, and the main interface that rsync provides to its reverse dependencies is an executable. Um, and an exec boundary is architecture neutral. So when, when you, uh, the, the kinds of things that depend on rsync depend on it because they want to call the rsync program. And it doesn't matter what architecture uh, the rsync package is or what architecture the calling package is, it just matters that there's something you can call. So that's a multi-arch foreign relationship where uh, the thing calling doesn't care what architecture you give it on the system. So this is important, for instance, if um, I think this one in particular has been marked as multi-arch foreign on account of the Linux kernel source packages in Ubuntu at least, um, build depend on rsync. If you want to cross build the kernel, you don't care about getting the ARM HF version of rsync. You care about getting whatever version of rsync is most convenient that you can run it. So that's why you have multi-arch colon foreign. So you can express that and so that the package manager can work out, do I have a version of rsync available? Yes, good, let's go. Instead of trying to cross install the other version of rsync for a different architecture, which then tries to remove the one you already have installed and then might try to remove other things that are, depend that are, that are depending on that as well. So, so that's multi-arch colon foreign is, is to say, here's a thing that is architecture agnostic. It has an architecture. So it's not architecture colon all, which where like there are no binary files in it and you install the exact same package on all architectures. It, it has an architecture as, as part of its nature, but the interfaces it provides are architecture independent. And because of that, we don't care for dependency satisfaction which architecture we have installed. We have a preference for which one we do install if there isn't one installed. We will always try to pick the most sensible one. The, the package manager will prefer whatever matches the native architecture if it can. But for, for satisfying dependency resolutions, if, if I go in and do rsync, app get install rsync colon i386, this should work. It might not, let's see. 
No. So it has some dependencies, where at, whereas rsync has actually been declared multi-arch colon, colon foreign. Um, it has some dependencies on other things that are not, and so it can't actually be installed in this case. But the, the annotations are, are correct on rsync itself. It's just additional packages have to be converted for multi-arch before it's useful in the archive. That is one nice thing about the way multi-arch has been specified, is that you don't have to do the conversions in any particular order. So the fact that this package, uh, the fact that rsync has been marked multi-arch colon foreign is not a bug. It doesn't, it doesn't have to wait for base files to, to um, be also marked multi-arch colon foreign or whatever in order to uh, be co-installable. And actually, I don't know if that's the correct solution for base files, I'll just say. But it, it doesn't have to wait for multi-archification of base files before you can mark rsync as uh, multi-arch colon foreign. Um, you can do these in any order, shove them in the archive. It's massively parallelizable. That's what we've done in Debian and in Ubuntu as far as converting libraries over. It's write the patch, push the patch to the, to the BTS. Um, when the maintainer gets around to uploading it and we've got a critical mass of them, then suddenly things just pop and start working. And that's kind of what's, what's happened over the past year where IA32 libs, I, I, let's see, I think we did a, uh, a multi-arch library sprint for Debian uh, back in December. Um, and basically pushed all the patches of the BTS. And then I went away and did other things for six months. And then I see popping up in June the discussion about how IA32Libs is ready to go away. And I'm like, oh, okay, that was easy. <laughs> so, um, so, right, even though I, in this case I can't install the foreign version of rsync in place of the, the, uh, the native one, nevertheless, if I were to try to do a cross build of something that that, that uh, uses rsync, like if I tried to cross-build the kernel package and it needed rsync, this would be sufficient to make it do the right thing. Or if I have other things that depend on rsync, I don't know if there's any good choices in here. Oh, I could try to install the foreign version of Ksplice. <laughs> Let's see what that does. Oh, <laughs> that didn't work. Dervish? <laughs> hmm? Uh, ARMHF is in the configuration um, as a foreign architecture on the system, so I don't know why exactly. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe I keep finding packages that are just architecture all, and that's why it's failing on me, because they don't actually exist in apt's view of the world as being foreign packages. So anyway, that is not a great example with respect to that. But in theory, if you had something that was uh, uh, an i386-only piece of software that depended on rsync, um, the rsync package is all ready to go where you can install your i386 binary on any system, um, and the native version of rsync will satisfy the dependency, which is usually the way we want to look at what multi-arch colon foreign is for. More often than not, in the vast majority of cases, a multi-arch colon foreign package is the one package on your system you will never install the foreign version of. Because it's the one that's satisfying the foreign dependencies of the other packages that, you, that are interesting to cross-install. Um, and you generally want only the native version, and that's how you say, this one is the only one I need, um, and you don't have to worry about trying to get the other version on, of it on the system. So a multi-arch colon same package is one that's co-installable uh, because all of the files are split into different directories and they, they uh, install alongside each other on the file system, whereas a multi-arch colon foreign package um, is not co-installable. You can only ever have one of those installed at a time. Um, but multi-arch colon foreign says whichever one you have installed does the job. And so that's, in a nutshell, that's what, m not a very small nutshell, it's kind of a coconut shell. The, that's what a multi-arch field means. And then we also have this multi-arch colon allowed thing, which uh, by and large I'm just going to ignore here on account of the fact that the Debian archive actually doesn't let you do anything useful with it yet today, although it's specified. Um, we've got some changes that have to be made on the, the build these before you can do anything um, really interesting with that. And so effectively today multi-arch colon allowed is treated the same as if you didn't have the multi-arch field at all because the packages that would make use of this have to change the syntax of their dependencies, and that's where things get hung up, because you have to have additional support in the package manager. Um, so 
Um, so how do you actually go about converting a package for multi-arch? Well, mostly, most of the time, the, the, the interesting case where we would look at this is for a library. And so that's why we have some documentation that's been written up about how we do this for libraries. Um, if you're not doing, if it's, if it's not a library that you're working with, if, if your package is an executable, the process for converting it for multi-arch is looking at it saying, do I provide any, any interfaces that are architecture specific? Or can anything call my program? If the answer is anything can call my program, well, then you ask, does it have any reverse dependencies, and is it actually interesting for something of a foreign architecture to call it? And if the answer to that is yes, you just put in the multi-arch colon foreign field in the binary package stanza um, of that, of that uh, package. For instance, here's one example from, from PAM, the PAM source package. We have uh, a helper package which actually was split out specifically to accommodate multi-arch, which I can get into in a little bit, perhaps. Um, but the, the binary package, it's a dash bin package, implying that the interfaces it provides are, are executables. Um, and it's tagged multi-arch colon foreign. And this little bit here is actually the only thing that that package requires in order to do its job in the multi-arch world. The more complicated part of things is when you're looking at uh, libraries. Um, and um, that's why we have this wiki page, which I, I heartily encourage people to bookmark or whatever people do in place of bookmarks now that browsers have made those obsolete. Um, Wiki.debian.org slash multi-arch slash implementation. Um, this page gives you what should be everything you need to know about actually converting a, a library package for multi-arch. Um, and the easiest way to do that uh, by far is to use dev helper um, dh1 with compatible 9, because that will basically do all the work for you. Um, and the only thing you need to do uh, is, let me find it. Um, this page is longer than I remembered. Maybe it's because the font is so much bigger. Uh, right. Uh, so this is what it takes to convert a package to multi-arch using DH1. Um, you have to bump your build dependency for the, com the, for the higher compat level. Um, there's this particular pre-dependency that you have to add, which is relevant specifically for arcane reasons of us only having partial support for multi-arch in the squeeze version of libc due to some late changes in, in how we decided we were actually specifying multi-arch on some architectures. So this is basically there to enforce that when you're doing an upgrade and your libraries are moving all over the place, you make sure that ld.so can find them before you start moving them. Because otherwise, things like apt, which use libraries, might notice and have a problem. Um, or your shell, or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the other thing. You, you do have to add this additional field of, of pre-depends, which becomes less important after, after uh, Wheezy releases, because then it, it, it re resolves to a dependency that will always be satisfied by the, the Wheezy versions of the packages. So that's an upgrade uh, handling thing there. Um, you say the Debian slash compat should be nine, um, and provided you're using a build system that um, has standard ways of specifying paths, then Dev Helper can do all the work for you and figure out, ah, we're compat level nine, let's put the libraries in the multi-arch directory for you. Um, currently, I think the only build system that we have a reliable way to do that for is auto tools. Um, I'm just gonna scroll here quickly through, and yeah, I think that's the only one that we have. Um, now, if somebody knows of a standard way to do this with, for instance, CMake, um, it would be great for somebody to update the documentation. We actually had a... It just works. <laughs> so, it just works. So, so the, the, the troubling thing about that is that um, I, think it, I think the CMake... I think that implies that CMake upstream has perhaps encoded some platform-specific knowledge and make, making some platform-specific platform guesses about what, where to install things, and that's, that's the... Or that we have Debian specific patches to do that, I think. Right. So it's it's relying it's using the C, well when you when you use CMake the build system logic is encoded in the CMake package which is installed as a build dependency and it has the patches that say put everything over there. Um, the reason we specifically didn't didn't cause that to turn on for Dev Helper um, 
and have Deb Helper automatically put things in without you bumping the compat level was that uh, it breaks, it's, first of all, you have to add that pre-dependency field, which is a manual operation. Um, and secondly, all of your .install files break because suddenly all the files not only have moved around, but have moved a, a directory level deeper. So all, even if you're using globbing, your globbing is going to fail. So in fact, I think in this wiki page, we specifically say something, something about why it's not automatic. Anyway, detailed rationale is given in the wiki page. But so basically, the, I looked at that and said, no, we, we shouldn't have this suddenly happen out from underneath the maintainer and just have it happen the next time the package is built because there's the, there are these other things you are always going to have to touch. Um, so at least for, for autoconf, um, what we do is with compat level 9, it passes the dash dash libdir option, which says this is the library directory for the architecture you're building for. Um, and of course it has, you know, Deb Helper is, is great about like encapsulating all of that and you can override it as needed. Um, and actually I will show you a package example where there are some deviations from the default um, and what that looks like in, in Dev Helper. And it looks, it, it's still simple like anything else you would do uh, with Dev Helper 1, uh, with DH1 with small overrides or whatever. Um, so you've, you've bumped Dev Helper, you've told it compat level 9, that's why you have to do this next step of your .install files. If it says use your lib currently, it's going to have to be changed. Um, and if you are doing anything special other than just listing the files, if you have to indicate a target of, of something to Dev Helper, whether that's a target of a symlink or a target of a directory creation or a target of, a, of an install, you have to um, figure out how to substitute the actual architecture name in, because obviously you can't use a glob as a target of a symlink or a target for installation. So um, the way this is done is the recommended way is to use DH exec, which is um, with, deb, with compat level 9, your .install file becomes a script that gets run. And you, you can build depend on DH exec. Um, and DH exec knows how to pull out various common substitutions automatically for you. So with no additional effort, um, you do something like this. and um, this is actually, it doesn't show well here because of the, the font size, but this is actually a single line where you're, you're saying, take the files that upstream installed into user lib directory such and such, and install them to this target directory, which has the architecture name in it. So that's, that's uh, how that's useful. Um, okay. Yeah, and as it says, you don't even have to do anything special in Debian rules because DH exec knows how to um, extract that information from the environment for you as needed. Um, so, um, once you've taken care of your .install files, the, the next thing you do is make sure that anything that you're telling the build system about through Debian rules, that you go through and, and scrub user lib and replace it with the architecture string. Um, in practice, most builds will automatically get this, this variable from the environment already without any additional effort. However, policy does say that you're not promised to have that set because if you call Debian slash rules directly as a, as, a, as a script, you don't get this in the environment, which means that um, uh, uh, that's why 7 applies. If you, if you had to actually uh, um, set that environment variable there, then you should also or, or you reference that environment variable, you should actually make sure you've set it somehow by um, by doing this little bit there. So, so yes. Yeah, so latest D package, or well, about three versions ago, has a include architecture dot muck, which sets all those variables. So mm -hmm. maybe we should just say put this line in. I hate make file includes as an interface. Right, because they're mysterious and you wonder what the hell it did. Yes, because there's no, there's no en encapsulation boundary about anything it does and, and they're very, it's, it's very easy to break them. So I, I know that's Buxy's position that, that Raphael says, yes, here's a, here's a make file snippet, just include this. I, I abhor that and um, yeah. <laughs> but yes, you're free to do so. They're your packages. <laughs> Um, so yeah, once you've gotten to step seven there and, and done all of that, um, I mean, step eight is you just set the multi-arch colon same field, um, 
and that's about it. Um, actually, step nine is, is kind of interesting. We talked a little bit about multi-arch foreign, foreign before. There's a, a strange little question of backwards compatibility where um, because, because we want the behavior of the package manager to not go haywire with existing packages that are in the archive, um, a multi-arch colon all package, even though it says it right in the name that it's colon all, if you actually want to use that as a dependency of a foreign package that you're installing, you have to explicitly say that it's multi-arch colon foreign. The reason for this specifically has to do with certain packages which are multi-arch colon all meta packages or, or defaults packages, in fact. Um, is probably a good term for them. So suppose you are depending on the package Python, which happens to be an architecture colon all package. However, what that actually is, is it's, it's an architecture all package which is masking a dependency on the current, multi, or the current architecture any package that you actually are depending on. So if you are up here and you're depending on the you're, you're depending on Python, because that's what we say is you don't, you don't over-specify your version that you want. You just say, I depend on Python. But the Python package doesn't just provide the interpreter user bin Python. It also provides some library interfaces. And if you're doing something with the Python package and you're depending on it and you actually want the library interfaces, um, it's not sufficient to just say, yeah, that any architecture all package satisfies the dependencies, because you can kind of get yourself messed up on the system on an upgrade, um, where if the right set of packages happen to not be available to you at the right time, or you do something ex um, extraordinarily convoluted with an apt get install, manual install, and not all the right packages have the multi-arch bit set, you can wind up trying to uh, swap out your Python for the wrong one, or say, yes, this Python satisfies dependencies when it doesn't. So because of that issue, the sad fact is that 80% of the, uh, the architecture all packages in the archive um, would need to be tagged multi-arch colon foreign um, because their interfaces are architecture independent, but we have no way to tell apart the ones that are from the ones that aren't. So in order to not break things on upgrade and change the semantics in a way that's incompatible with the packages we already have, you have to do this extra step. So for instance, if you have a, a, a libfoo-common package uh, it's architecture all, you still need to mark it as multi-arch colon foreign so that the package manager can look at that and say, yeah, okay, you've, you've looked at it, you've made sure it's actually safe, and we will use that to satisfy the dependency of each runtime version of the library that depends on it. Um, so, I mean, and, and this, this wiki page covers other, other scenarios. There's a, actually, I'll scroll up to the index of them. Um, there's instructions for how to do CDBS with auto tools and dev helper. Um, step one, convert it to DH1. Uh, classic dev helper, which with not using DH1 or CDBS with auto tools, auto tools with no helper at all. Um, CMake apparently doesn't need a section because it's all automatic anyway. I don't know. Um, this is, it's a wiki page. Please help extend it if you have other build systems that have sort of standard ways to, to do this sort of thing. I'd love to have more documentation. Um, a lot of the people that were working on multi-arch uh, were most familiar with auto tools as a build system and some of the, that allowed a certain amount of bias to creep in in the implementation plan in the sense that um, we kind of forgot there were things that weren't auto tools that don't do as good of a job of, of doing build time detection of environments and then we discover that, oh, oh yeah, we actually have a whole lot of other build systems we have to go out there and, and patch to find the libraries that we moved because we thought it would use the, the link, the, the, the compiler's path to actually figure out where the libraries are and it wasn't doing that. So things that, uh, one of the, the consequences of converting a library to multi-arch that, that was surprising to us at the time was that um, suddenly you have things like the PHP build system which walk the file system looking for the library you specified. You could have just asked the compiler if it was there and it would have told you, but so be it. Um, 
and, and it, it, PHP, not to pick on PHP specifically, it's just one example. I think we had some issues with the, the Python build system as well, um, and I, those are two examples that come to mind, but I, there, there were a number of others where, where we find ourselves playing a little bit of whack-a-mole, where every time we moved a library, we found a few more reverse dependencies that would stop building because they couldn't find the library now. So that is one thing to, to be aware of. So um, it does mean that if there are any members of the release team listening, we should probably be careful about um, doing further library multi-arch conversions in, in, uh, in Wheezy without making sure that things still build afterwards and, th and that they build and that they don't misbuild. So it's something to be, be careful about. Um, okay, so real examples of, of what things look like here. Uh, I happen to maintain a couple of library packages myself. Um, FreeType is one of them. Um, and here's the, here's the Debian rules for that. Oh, we need to go up a couple of sizes still. Yeah. So this is the Debian rules for free type. Um, you see that we are explicitly setting uh, deb host multi arch as well as deb host arch, which I don't recall why that is there, but I guess we will see as we scroll down. Um, other stuff that's not related here to multi arch. We're doing some uh, different C flags and whatnot. Using, using the great D package build flags interface there. Um, some stuff about symbol checking, crazy stuff we don't actually like to look at because it reminds us of bad times. Um, and then we, here we have the, the DH1 glo global rule here, which just calls DH with all arguments. Um, let's see exactly why we do have D dev host multi arch being set. Aha. So here's, here's an interesting sort of thing that's going on here. Um, it's being referenced in DH auto install. We have a, an override rule for DH auto install. So the, everything else has actually pretty much done itself, done its work for us, but we happen to have a special case here where we are stripping uh, the dependency libs field out of libfreetype.la, um, which probably can go away now because the, the .la transition is fairly far along. Actually, in this case, I could have used a glob instead and it would have worked just as well. Um, but that's the only reason that, that this particular one cares about um, multi-arch. Yeah, that's the last occurrence in the, in the file. So the, the, the general bits are really just this right here. So because we're using Debian Compat level nine, um, that pretty much takes care of itself. Um, the control file, what, what do we look at, at for the binary packages? Well. The libfreetype6 runtime library, it has that pre-depends we mentioned that um, gets expanded. Yeah, I will show you, oh, not on this machine, I won't. Um, uh, that's what that expands out to. It's a, it's a dev helper variable that um, gets expanded to multi-arch-support, which is a twisty little um, uh, transitional package built by glibc that um, ensures that you've got the right version of glibc on um, before you upgrade. And so that's the pre-dependency and multi-arch colon same means that you can have more than one version installed at a time, which I think, in fact, I do. Yeah, there we go. There's a, an AMD64 version and an i386 version. Doesn't the fact that the pre-dependence is not versioned means that we have to keep it forever? Um, so it's not versioned in order to hide all the details of what versions are actually required. It's, it's, I'll show you what the multi-arch support package actually looks like. Um, right, the AMD64 version of it depends on this version of libc6, which you'll see this is actually a rather old version of libc6, um, which is satisfied from squeezy and, uh, squeezy, squeeze into a four. Um, now, if I do a, if I look at the i thirty six one, however, you'll see that it depends on a much newer libc because that was we we it was much later when we finalized what version uh, we we finalized the architecture path we were using on i thirty six. There was some back and forth discussion, and we wound up changing our minds much later than than we would have hoped. And basically, because it was changed after the squeeze release, we have to make sure that this upgrade support is in place. So. The multi-arch support package is going to be around for a while. Um, we don't need to get rid of it. However, once 
um, Wheezy releases, we can get rid of the pre-depends. We can change dev helper to not add the pre-depends in unstable um, because it's, it's a no-op. It's just adding nodes to the, the package dependency graph that don't really do anything different. They're already satisfied on any system. So, um, yeah, we can phase that out. The, the, the actual pre-depends, misc, misc pre-depends feature of, 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 um, of dev helper, now that it's there, I think it's actually been used in a couple of different scenarios as well. So if you've added the field to your source package, you might as well keep it. But down the line, I think we'll see it falling out of the, the, the binary packages. Um, so right, that's the, the, the runtime library package. Nothing too fancy there. It's just multi-arch same means you can have more than one of it. Um, what else do we have? We have the libfree type 6-dev package, which is not currently marked multi-arch colon same um, because of a little thing called free type dash config, which we discussed last hour. Free type 2-demos, they're demo fi demos, they, they just, they're just programs you can run that are examples. Um, I have not bothered to mark this package as multi-arch colon foreign. Why? Because there are no reverse dependencies in the archive and marking it multi-arch colon foreign only matters if it has reverse dependencies. So although I could install a foreign architecture version of this package, there's no reason to mark it multi-arch colon foreign because nothing depends on it. So it would, it would be useless information. So actually here, why don't I show you that I can in fact install Now this one should work. I should be able to install free type 2 demos i386 because the library, yeah, there it goes. It's, it's running out there and grabbing it. And you see it's, even though I'm on an AMD64 system, but the, uh, the package that's been installed here is the i386 version of the package. Um, and it installs just fine. It doesn't have to be marked multi-arch colon foreign to do that. Um, your, your leaf packages that are actually, for the, for the average user, the most interesting thing you would want to install foreign architectures of. So, for instance, Skype, which only has an i386 executable anywhere in the world. Um, that package, the, the multi-arch system is designed such that those existing packages that are out there that Debian doesn't necessarily control or have any influence over the, the, the binary package control file, um, those should install just fine. You only have to annotate the dependencies. The, 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 dependent, the packages being depended on are what have to be annotated to make this work. So free type 2-demos, supposing that were a non-free binary package being distributed by a third party, it had to have no modifications done to install in a multi-arch scenario and have all of its dependencies satisfied. Um, free type happens to be a library. It's a fairly core library, so it has a, a UDEB that's used by the installer. Um, we don't do multi-arch in the installer because why would you ever want to have multi-arch in your installer? It, it would, if, if you need more than one ABI in your installer, I think something's wrong. Um, at least I, I hope I'm right about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so in fact, the, most of the UDEB packages still install directly to userlib and slash lib instead of using the multi-arch directories. They don't have to, but it's just that some of the tooling around the installer is rather um, domain specific and there's lots of special cases of libraries and so it's just simpler to put them in the, the user lib path. I do know in the early days of multi-arch, it did actually cause a problem for the installer. I think mklibs might have had a problem with them not being in the right place or something. But So UDEBs generally you don't do anything with those at all. Um, let's see, so let's look at the .install file. There you go. You've got that extra glob there saying, grab me all the .so li uh, runtime libraries in subdirectories of lib, because they've all moved down a level. Um, so like, there's user lib on my system, which is rather full. Um, but user lib, uh, yeah, actually, let's loop this way. There's as much stuff in the subdirectory of user lib for the architecture as there is in user lib at this point. So, um, you know, there's quite a lot that's been moved over into that subdirectory. 
Um, I think, actually, I, I should probably stop there as far as rambling on up here and start taking questions on account of the fact that we are running low on time. So, yeah, five minutes. So what questions can I answer for people about multi-arch? Who in here is a library package maintainer? Show of hands. Okay, put your hands down if you have already converted them to multi-arch. Okay. So you should have questions, the four of you. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to ask an easy question. Um, <laughs> the library package um, that I'm thinking of is AuthBind. Is what? AuthBind. Okay. It's an LD preload hack. Yes. Um, so uh, if you install it, you probably want, let us say, both the AMP64 and i386 LD preloads, but you want yeah. the binary, the, the sort of little wrapper binary, and there's a set you would help a program, so I'll have to split it into two yeah. packages. But how do I make sure that all the .SOs get installed? Good question. Um, Multi-Arch has failed to solve that one because it was not an issue we, we identified early up in the process. But uh, I think you were part of the, the mailing list discussion on Debian Devel where that question was being right. asked. It's something we should solve because it doesn't affect just uh, not LD preload hacks, but like, for instance, uh, PAM modules, NSS modules, any sort of plugins that you're installing, you generally want to try to install those for as many architectures as you can and that you're using on the system at the same time. What bodge would you recommend in the meantime? I don't, I don't have a recommendation. Or? <laughs> I don't know. I, um, I think it... I, I, there were some ideas in that thread. I'd have to go back and, and look at what was suggested there. Um, but I do remember some people came up with some kind of hacks that might have worked. But the, the right answer in the long term is that we need to have the package manager have some smarts about this. And it might require additional annotation for the uh, declaring that, hey, this is, this is a package that I, I want my brothers to come with me when I install it. So that's going to require additional information because the you know, you can't tell just by looking at the fact that it's multi-arch colon same that that's the case. It's not so much a, it's a question, but it's more of a, a result of all the changes that go through with multi-arch. We don't explicitly support um, building packages from Wheezy on, on Squeeze. We have ways of doing backports and things like that, but if you're doing a backport from this kind of situation, you're going to have to take the changes to the install files out before yes. it's going to be able to build on squeeze. Yes. You um, might have to, I mean, do you have to take out the multi-arch lines in demo control as well, or will they just be ignored by squeeze? I think they're just ignored, aren't they? I think you will get a warning from dpackage that but it's unused. an unknown field, but it will be thrown away. Yeah. Um, and it's probably, it's probably good, uh, good practice to take them out anyway. If you're taking out the, uh, the change to the install mm -hmm. files, you probably should take out right. the uh, indicators as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you're doing doing a a, if you're doing a backport, you definitely have to make some source changes. How many or few of those you choose to do, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, Right, I'll repeat the question. So the question is, uh, will it break the multi-arch upgrade if the fields are there? Um, and I. I believe the answer is no. So first of all, I don't think the, the squeeze D package puts it into the binary file, the, the binary control file. I think it's, it spits out a warning and says, this is an unknown, f unknown field, so I'm ignoring it. Second of all, if it were there, the package manager in squeezy, I don't know why I keep saying squeezy, in squeeze, that's, that'll be the next release name. How about that? Well, I'll talk to Neil about it afterwards. Um, <laughs> in squeeze um, doesn't understand that field at all and so just ignores it. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any effect on calculating the dependencies. Um, and you're using the, the squeeze version of apt when you're doing the upgrade. So it, it, the upgrade is done with the previous version of, of apt. If you're doing it like a normal person. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's... And even if it were in the new version, it's not like if you're doing an upgrade, you don't have any foreign, any packages of a foreign architecture currently installed, nor do you have any architectures configured in dpackage. So there is no possible way that it, as part of the upgrade it's going to miscalculate anything and, and pick packages from a wrong architecture because that requires an explicit action by the user to enable multi-arch. 
And just maybe adding to the question of backports, the dev helper backport, uh, even if you keep the compatibility 9, has the multi arch bits taken out. Yes, and that's necessary because if you did do a backport using a dev helper backport, backport that enabled the, the multi arch bits and built it on squeeze, on squeeze, it would be uninstallable on i386 because the glibc is not new enough in squeeze. Any other questions? What happens if you're um, installing packages that puts things in, et cetera, and say so you have the ARMHF version and the i386 version? Presumably, they have to be in, lock, in lockstep versions. Mm -hmm. So Otherwise if you're saying the cases that you have config files that vary by architecture? No, that, that don't vary by architecture. So the config file is the same for both ARM and, and i386 in the package. Don't change anything because the dpackage implementation of, of uh, multi-arch says that if the file is the same in both packages, you share it on the file system. It ref counts it and that's it. And what happens if they're different? If they're different, then you would need to somehow change the package to look at an architecture specific path for it. So um, I think there are some examples of this with... Uh, No. Uh, maybe they've all gone away. Maybe they've been moved to slash user share or something. But I do remember there used to be at least some. Oh, I think maybe it's Pango. Is that? Mm, no. Anyway, there have been examples where a library has a config file which requires architecture specific information. Um, and the solution has been to encode the architecture name in the directory that it's using and just split the hierarchy within, et cetera. There's no, uh, multi-arch has not attempted to, to specify to that level of granularity what the correct thing is. Um, so it's, you know, make it up as you go. Just make sure it's unique and, and that they can co-install. And I'm being told time is up. So thanks everyone for coming. Hope it was uh, helpful to you. <laughs>